Okay, let's back up. Last section we talked about how food is the only produce of land that can always afford rent. If you missed it, you can click here. So it says the reason for that was that there is always going to be somebody out there who wants it and always somebody out there who is willing to pay for it. When Smith says able to afford rent, what he is doing is referring back to the three components of price, wages, profit, and rent. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you might want to revisit my summary on the subject. You'll be able to find it here. In that chapter, chapter six, we discussed how each component of price in different commodities and in different products makes up a different uh, amount, different percentage of the price, and it varies from product to product. A product requiring a lot of labor but a little stock might attribute a larger proportion to wages than to profit. But just like profit behaves differently than wages, rent behaves very differently than both. Sometimes the production itself cannot possibly yield a high enough price to cover the wages that were put, it in, uh, put into it, the natural profits, and rent to the landlord. This is of course unless the landlord and the initial investor are consolidated, but in this case we consider that natural profit, not rent. Either way, less relevant to the main point of this chapter, which is whether or not production can afford rent is strictly dependent on the powers of improvement of labor to be able to produce more food. I.e. the higher the yield of food in a given country, the more that country would be able to afford rent for other productions. How did Smith come to this conclusion? I will do my absolute best to eliminate. Smith considers an improved land a land that is developed, i.e. owned, quartered, cultivated. Unimproved land is usually unowned and uncultivated. This means land roamed by nomads or barbarians, as Smith would put it. So if the first section of this hideously long chapter talks about food, the greatest want of mankind, the second section of this chapter will talk about the second greatest want of mankind, clothing and lodging. And Smith says that these things sometimes can and sometimes cannot afford rent. Whether or not it can afford rent is based on its level of improvedness. An unimproved land, says Smith, can afford to house and clothe people who live there in the way that they need it in actual abundance, but since their land is uncultivated, they likely have a shortage of food. On the flip side, a cultivated land will have an abundance of food, but smaller access to clothing and lodging. Smith gives quite a long explanation for how he came to this conclusion, but I'm going to jump to the way that brought it home for me. Let's say there's a village in the middle of Africa somewhere. Picture it for a moment. What do you see? Did you picture huts made out of clay and straw? I recently stumbled onto a cooking travel blog by an African travel expert named Anouk Zilma. I put the link in the description for anybody who's interested. She recounts her experience watching the women of the village build their homes. It takes a woman about a week to build a hut, which her family will be able to use for approximately the next three years. Let's describe a small amount of division of labor to this village, and for the sake of argument, forget the fact that huts need to be built during the dry season. It takes one woman one week to build one home for one family. If that woman was the sole village hut builder, she could sustain in a year's worth of work enough huts for 156 families. One hut per week, 52 weeks per year, a hut lasts approximately three years. The rest of the village, the rest of the time, work very hard at gathering, hunting, and producing food for the rest of the village, and they barely make it. According to the USDA, agriculture and related industries account for 9.2% of employment in USA, which means that it requires less than 10% of the population to produce enough food for that particular population. And the abundance of food in that country is unprecedented. Whether or not everyone has access to it is an entirely different discussion. That being said, clothing and housing in that country are far more expensive than in undeveloped countries. This is because it is far more extravagant. So let's bring this back. Undeveloped countries can provide an abundance of clothing and lodging to the people that live there as they need them, and developed countries can provide for an abundance of food. This abundance of food is what gives rise to the concept of wealth as we know it, portrayed by possessions. Fancy cars, designer clothes, expensive jewelry. Rich people don't actually eat more. Their food may be more expensive, it may be harder to prepare, but they don't actually eat more than poor people. So if they're wealthy, this isn't going to show up in the amount of food they keep in their pantry. It's going to show up in the brand of car that they drive, the size and niceness of their home, the amount and quality of their clothing. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, what exactly is it that they traded for their larger home and their nicer car? If it's what they have extra of, that's food. But it's not just that they have extra of it. It's that it's the one thing that they have extra of that other people are always going to want. Poor people spend their entire lives working in order to make the rich feel richer so that they can exchange it for food to eat. Smith finishes off this section by telling the story of the Spaniards landing in Cuba and Santa Domingo for the first time. The Spaniards found that the locals used gold in their hair like Europeans would use shiny pebbles, nothing special. They felt that if the natives would use it like baubles in their hair that it would be so plentiful that obviously everybody there would be so rich. But Smith claims their premise was actually false. What the Europeans found valuable in gold is nothing the natives could have received. The value the Spaniards saw was that this gold could be traded for food. You see, the natives never found any value in gold because they never knew anybody who would trade something so rare and so valuable as food for some shiny object. If you found that helpful, please like the video if you want to know when the next episode comes out. Subscribe to my channel and you can follow me on Tumblr or Facebook.